cells, the building blocks of life. Since the invention of the microscope, biologists have been probing the secrets of the cell. For the first 300 years, progress was slow. The inner workings of cells were simply too small to be studied critically. But with improvement in optics, coupled with the development of the electron microscope, the cell began to yield its secrets. No mysterious protoplasm here, but rather an incredibly complex, highly organized and tightly controlled chemical factory. Biologists are continuing to probe the workings of cells, how they obtain energy, how they reproduce, the exact function of the various kinds of particles, membranes and tubules which seem to fill each living cell. It's fair to say that cell biologists are beginning to understand how cells work. However, a basic question remains, the question of origin. Where did cells come from? How did they develop during the early stages of life on our planet? This question must be answered if we are to fully understand these basic building blocks of life. Tracing events which happened when the Earth was new is a difficult kind of scientific detective work. Only recently has enough evidence become available to attempt a theoretical reconstruction of cell history. It's a story of mind-stretching discoveries and surprises. And it's a story which must start with the simplest cells found on the Earth today. Bacteria. Probing these incredibly small organisms, the electron microscope has revealed an amazing fact. The bacterial cell is basically different from the cells of plants and animals. Not only is it hundreds of times smaller, it is a cell without a nucleus. The term prokaryote has been applied to bacteria and other life forms which do not have nuclei. Here, pro means before, and karyote means nucleus, implying that prokaryotes are simple, primitive cells of an ancient type. In the late 1970s, scientists working with rock samples from Australia discovered evidence for extremely early life on our planet. Fossils of bacteria-like cells in rocks three and one-half billion years old. On a timeline, beginning with the origin of the Earth at approximately 4.6 billion years ago and extending to the present, the ancient fossils are found here. These earliest known life forms were similar in structure to certain bacteria found today living in hot springs. A hot spring is a time capsule, an environment which has probably not changed very much over vast stretches of time and it's an environment completely dominated by prokaryotes. Living prokaryotes are giving biologists an idea of how early cells may have carried out their life functions. For example, living in these matted layers are bacteria which perform a primitive kind of photosynthesis, converting light energy into chemical energy for life. But unlike green plants, no oxygen is given off. Do these hot springs bacteria retain a simple, early form of photosynthesis? If this line of thinking is correct, then communities of life on the Earth of three and a half billion years ago may have looked something like this. It was a time of yellow scums and tiny swimming cells. A billion and a half years go by before evidence of change shows up in the fossil world. At this point on the timeline, around two billion years ago, new chemicals begin appearing in the rocks. These red layers are oxides, indicating that a large amount of oxygen was being introduced into the atmosphere. There is no evidence of atmospheric oxygen before this time, and it's certain that early Earth was chemically a very different kind of place than it is today. Also in these two billion year old rocks, there is evidence of prokaryotes which were more complex than bacteria. Layered fossils similar to those left today by blue-green algae.
Unlike earlier prokaryotes, these long chains of blue-green cells carry out complete photosynthesis in which oxygen is given off as a waste product. Biologists interpret this as evidence that blue-green prokaryotes were responsible for initiating our present life support system. Think of it, microscopic blue-green cells affecting an entire planet, bubble by bubble. Oxygen produced by prokaryotes must have been poisonous to organisms which evolved in the previously oxygen-free world. However, for those able to adapt, there was a substantial benefit, a better way to get energy from food molecules, using oxygen. As a food molecule is broken down within a cell, energy released is picked up by an energy carrier molecule called ATP. Without oxygen, a bacterial cell produces only two ATP molecules for each molecule of sugar it breaks down. With oxygen, the same amount of sugar produces 18 times as much ATP. Quite a difference. With their improvements in energy utilization, prokaryotes flourished. The Earth was becoming a more interesting place biologically. Then, about a billion years ago, things began changing rapidly as seen in the rocks at the bottom of Grand Canyon. At this time, an entirely new type of cell began leaving imprints. A cell with a nucleus, a eukaryote. Single-celled eukaryotes abound today, hundreds of different species. To study them, all one need do is to collect a jar of pond water add a few pinches of fish food, and in a few days, a teeming community of eukaryotic cells results. There is a striking contrast here. Packed with internal structures, a eukaryotic cell is far more complex than the tiny prokaryotes swarming in the culture. The waters of a billion years ago must have been a natural laboratory exploring the possibilities in this new form of cell life. The great eukaryote experiment laid out a basic cell design found today in all plant and animal cells. However, our question remains, how did such a giant leap in cellular complexity occur? In searching for answers, cell biologists are taking cells apart and studying their components in isolation. One cell particle which is giving biologists a glimpse into the mystery of eukaryote evolution is the chloroplast. Chloroplasts are small rounded bodies that carry out photosynthesis. In living plant cells, they convert solar energy into chemical energy, make food molecules, and give off oxygen. A surprising new finding is that the chloroplast, while being a vital part of the plant cell, can exist, at least for a time, outside of its cellular environment. For example, investigators have injected chloroplasts extracted from plant cells into chicken eggs. In this foreign environment, the chloroplasts not only survive, but given light, they multiply. Very recently, biologists have discovered that what can happen in the lab also happens in nature. Certain sea slugs found living on coral reefs are able to transport chloroplasts from algae they have eaten into their own tissues, producing their green color. These strange animals have taken advantage of the chloroplast's ability to live independently and become chloroplast farmers. The fact that chloroplasts can live outside of their cell poses an intriguing question. 
Is it possible that these fundamental food manufacturing bodies were at some time in the past independent organisms? Imagine what might have happened a billion years ago. A primitive nucleated cell makes its living by engulfing blue-green prokaryotes. Now what if some of the photosynthetic cells survived and continued to manufacture food? With time, the two species share more and more of their functions. Eventually, their lives become interwoven in a kind of symbiosis, a shared experience. Today, biologists are finding that many single-celled organisms contain smaller green cells. In these cooperative relationships, the larger cell provides protection along with nutrients needed for photosynthesis. The smaller cells inside provide food. This symbiosis between a host cell and its small green guests is strikingly similar to a plant cell crowded with chloroplasts. Did chloroplasts originate in just this way, as photosynthetic prokaryotes? But symbiotic relationships can be broken as well as made. If the symbiotic theory is correct, then we might look for nucleated cells able to live without their chloroplasts. The evidence is no further than the nearest roadside scum-covered pond. This is Euglena, a primitive eukaryotic cell containing about a dozen chloroplasts. Treat a euglena culture with antibiotics and clear euglenoids will begin showing up. These cells have lost their chloroplasts, but given food, they are able to survive and reproduce. However, once lost, chloroplasts cannot be regained. These facts are evidence that chloroplasts, the primary food manufacturing particles of plant cells, were once independently living organisms. The symbiotic theory has led to a search for other ancient connections. Energy, the wondrous driving force of life. Each cell is powered by a special energy source, mitochondria. A hard-working muscle cell, or a single-celled organism, contains many mitochondria. These bacteria-sized particles are energy providers, oxidizing food molecules, and releasing energy for cell work. This electron micrograph shows a single mitochondrion. Here, food molecules are broken down with oxygen to produce usable energy in the form of ATP. Like chloroplasts, mitochondria reproduce by division. They are surprisingly like symbiotic prokaryotes living within a host cell. Another cell structure which may have had a symbiotic origin is the whip-like flagellum found in many eukaryotic cells, including the sperm cells of mammals. Did a wiggly, motile bacterium enter into the partnership, providing locomotion? Here the evidence is not quite as convincing as it is for chloroplasts and mitochondria. However, it's fascinating to think that the means whereby sperm reaches egg might be provided by the descendant of an ancient symbiotic prokaryote. The symbiotic theory helps account for one of the great steps in the history of life, the origin of complex eukaryotic cells. With the development of eukaryotes, the slow pace of evolution must have picked up dramatically. Cells formed simple colonies, began communicating with each other, and in time, developed into multicellular organisms, the ancestors of modern plants and animals. And so, from the early prokaryotic cells of three and a half billion years ago, to the eukaryotes of one billion years ago, 
our timeline advances to the present. How recent we humans are. The earliest evidence of human life appears here, a few million years back. Our own species is a very new development in the story of cellular life, a story that cell biologists are just beginning to understand.